As a child, I grew up with a Scottish father who had immigrated to Australia in 1970, met my mother, got married, and of course, he's me. Growing up with a dad originally from East Kilbride in Glasgow, Scotland, as you'd expect, he had many a tale to tell about growing up in post-war conditions, tales of snow, what real twilight looked like, and a few spooky stories as well. There was one such story that stuck with me into adulthood, even after Dad sadly passed away. It was the story of a strange encounter as he walked home as a teen behind the Calderwood Estates in East Kilbride one wintry twilight. Dad was taking a shortcut home from a friend's house. It was cold, near to Hogmanay, which is Scottish New Year. Snow lay on the ground, everything was completely still and quiet, and night was rapidly approaching. As he walked, my dad noticed he could suddenly hear someone walking behind him. Quick, light footsteps crunching in the snow. From his periphery, he could see the small figure of a teenage girl of around 17 years of age, walking close behind him. Dark hair with a pale face. And no, I'm not about to sing Ed Sheeran. Just so you know. So dad keeps walking, but he slowed his pace and so did the girl. He even stopped a couple of times, so did the girl. Not wanting to turn and confront her and scare her away, Dad also kept walking. He would also tell me that the area behind the estates was very eerie and that a murder had happened there years before. Believing the young woman to also have taken this as a shortcut home for the night perhaps, and maybe she'd gotten spooked, Dad thought maybe she was sticking close to him for protection but was maybe too shy or too jumpy to speak to him. So dad, not wanting to frighten her if this was indeed the case, kept walking until he could see from the corner of his eye that she was pretty much right behind him, like we're talking about to walk on his heels close. So by this time, dad is starting to begin to get a little creeped out himself. So he's like, okay, enough's enough. I'm gonna to have to see who this person is. So he then made the decision to turn to face the young lady and ask if she was okay, if she needed help. The footsteps stopped when dad stopped and he turned around to find not a soul was there. Only one set of footprints was in the snow, his own. No trace of his silent female companion. There was no time for her to run into the estate or run onto the golf course running behind the estate. She was simply gone. At this, Dad was pretty scared and legged it the rest of the way home. He would tell my grandmother what he saw and she would say to Dad it may be the spirit of a young girl who was killed on the golf course all those years ago. Her name, as Dad would tell me, was Anne Neelands, or Annie Neelands as Dad referred to her. For years, I wondered on the validity of the story until I began researching as subject for today's Real Crime International and I decided upon the home country of my dad. And this one actually comes courtesy to me of mum because she found a documentary on this guy and thought that I might be interested in it because he was active at the same time that my dad was living in East Kilbride as a child. And so that's why I have decided upon Scotland this week, the home country of my father and its first and most famous notorious serial killer, Peter Manuel. So as I began reading about him and watching the true crime docos, my blood turned to absolute ice in my veins as I was looking at the very girl my dad had told me about all those years ago, Anne Neelands, 17 of East Kilbride, small, dark haired and pretty found dead on the golf course behind the Calderwood Estates on January 2nd, which is Hogmanay in Scotland, 1956, which would have made my dad around seven, six or seven years of age when this occurred. So 10 years later, he believed that maybe he had met the ghost of Annie Neelands, maybe reliving the terrible walk home and maybe this time hoping that somebody would save her 
Whatever happened to Dad, that story and the poor girl always stuck with me and I finally found her. She was a real person who died at the hands of a deranged, psychotic lunatic. This is Real Crime International, Scotland's first serial killer, Peter Manuel. So if you're ready to take a deep dive with me into the scary world of post-war Scotland and the Gorbals in East Kilbride where my daddy grew up, join me here today. And if you've not seen me before, hello everybody, my name is Andrea M and this is one of my real crime videos, this one being Real Crime International, where we leave Australia and head for parts unknown to explore different crime cases of all different sorts from all over the world. And I've wanted to do Scotland for a very long time because as I just said, my daddy came from there. And there, Scotland is a very eerie place. Like there's a lot of scary things about Scotland. And my dad did have more stories, but the one about maybe meeting Annie Nealon's ghost really stuck with me. And I always wondered about her, I always wondered what she looked like and I finally got to find her. So it was good to have that validation. Uh, my dad did have a, a very spooky experience and that it well may have been Annie asking dad for help maybe because as I've said before you guys already know this that I have been a psychic medium clairvoyant since the age of three my dad was also very intuitive he was very clairvoyant as well and I'd say this was probably one of his first experiences with a spirit and it just happened to be who we believe to be Annie Nealands. We don't have any definitive proof that it was her, but he did see her behind the Coldwood Estates, between the estates and the golf course, and that was where, unfortunately, Annie's body was discovered after she had been unalived by Peter Manuel. But if you've never been here before, like I said, hello and welcome. It's lovely to have you here. If you're not subscribed to the channel yet and you've been watching for a while, please consider subscribing because you guys don't know how much it helps me out when you actually do that. We are still trying to get to our first 1,000 subs so that I can join the entirety of the partnership program. I've already been invited to apply for supers and advertising and merch, but I am waiting until I can apply for the full thing. There's a lot of tax stuff that's got to be figured out with this. It's not just all fun and games here on YouTube. You have to be responsible. So I really need an appointment with my tax uh, accountant first. So I know how to handle this. Because if you're a creator from Australia and you're wanting to get monetized on YouTube, YouTube is an American company. And um, I just need to figure out all the ins and outs of international tax and such. But after that, I can then apply to get um some of the monetization i'm still requiring a thousand subscribers and i think it's 400 hours of public watch time so if you guys would love to help me with that i would be very very grateful indeed and it would be lovely to see you coming back every week and join our little real crime family here and if i haven't mentioned it before i'm pretty sure i have though we have now three channels that we are working with here on youtube so the second channel is our channel for the original sound lounge as they've taken me on as their media support and their camera woman and that's all to do with live and local music local songwriters local talent here in the clarence valley and i will be continuing to film shows at the brush grove hotel at grumpy's rock cafe and other places as uh, more acts continue to pop up and be brought to you by the Original Sound Lounge. And if you would like to check out some of those apps, please access our new channel at the Original Sound Lounge. I will leave links in the description box and you can go and check out some really amazing, talented local artists who not only are, oh my God, amazing musicians and know exactly what they're doing, they write their own material. So if you wanna go and listen to some music you never heard before, please go check out the original Sound Lounge. We'd love to have you over there as well. Now, the other announcement I have before we get into this ghastly case this morning is I have a third channel. Now, I've had it for a while and it started out as being a channel. I was going to do scary story narrations, but I sort of found I wasn't sort of gelling with it as much as I thought I would. Um, I did a few on this channel last year for Halloween and I thought, yeah, I'd love to try that for another channel. But I have noticed, because I am a connoisseur of 
the scary story narrators on YouTube. I, I've subscribed to so many and I have so many favourites. But I do notice that a lot of them, and this isn't anyone's fault, they do um, kind of tell a lot of the same tales over because, you know, they're getting them from places like Reddit. Some are lucky enough to have people actually writing in. So I didn't sort of want to be taking stories away from somebody else who was already very established and people were already comfortable with. Um, I was also finding it difficult to find time to just sit down and narrate stories with everything else that I'm doing. So I have rebranded that channel. It is now Andrea M Vlogs and it's going to be a travel channel. Now I have a very exciting road trip planned for this weekend with two of my subscribers who have also become very good friends of mine and if you want to see where we're going you're going to have to watch the new channel because the videos are going to be all over on there. I did start this off as an arts and crafts and a vlog channel but I wasn't getting a lot of interest at that time or wasn't very established. I was also having trouble finding time to just sit down and do art videos for everybody and there is a big saturation of talented artists on YouTube and we're very very lucky because honestly you can learn anything on YouTube and I have to just say how grateful I am to all the other creators on here that I have learned so much from as well I absolutely love YouTube and I love all of my favorites on YouTube there's some amazing there's some amazing people on here so I've decided I do have some trips coming up over the winter that I'm very excited about and that I want to film for. But I don't want to be like having a higgledy-piggledy of things on this channel. I sort of want to keep it to our true crime, our paranormal and our, our other weird things that we like. So that is going to be the travel channel when I'm, you know, out and about filming. Uh, I've got some camping coming up soon. I'm really excited about. I haven't camped since I was in high school, so I'm really excited about this, but I'll tell you more as the situation gets closer. But this weekend, we are off, away from Grafton, going somewhere else, and I'm going to vlog it for a new channel. So I will link that in the description box below. Also, if you guys want to head over there and subscribe to that channel, and um, I think you're really going to enjoy the videos that we're going to be shooting this weekend. So that's all the news. That's everything I need to get you caught up on. So let's just dive into today's case. And as I have dubbed him myself, the East Kilbride or the Scottish version of the Ripper, Peter Manuel. So East Kilbride, where my dad grew up, uh, there is a Gaelic name for it. I think it's Seal Brigid and Air is the largest town in South Lanarkshire in Scotland and it's the country's sixth largest locality by population. It was also designated Scotland's first new town on the 6th of May 1947. So just on that, that wasn't too um, far before my dad was actually born. So dad was born in August of 1949. So it hadn't been um, designated a, a new town for very long so dad was kind of like a new baby in a new town so that's pretty cool. So the area lies on a raised plateau to the south of a place called Cathkin Braes and it's about eight miles or 13 kilometers southeast of Glasgow and it's close to the boundary with another town called East Renfrewshire. And it also, unfortunately, became the home to its first and most brutal serial killer, Peter Manuel. There are a lot of other lovely things about East Kilbride that my dad used to tell me about, uh, like the snow in the winter. He loved snow. Um, he also said there used to be little birds that would come down that were still kind of around in winter and they used to feed them like little crumbled up pieces of biscuit or toast and um, they used to like leave a little bit of milk for the birds that was with him and his grandmother my granny Grant and uh, yeah so it's actually a very nice place but it also has a very dark history so you can go to Glasgow there is actually a police museum in Glasgow that caters extensively to the case of Peter Manuel and it is the, probably the most discussed series of crimes remembered by visitors who go to the Glasgow Police Museum or for people who are interested 
in the murders committed by Peter Manuel. So Peter Manuel was active from 1956 to 1957. So my dad would have been around the ages of five and six, uh, five, six, seven, maybe eight, when Peter Manuel was active in East Kilbride. And this guy, let me tell you, he did not discriminate. He would kill anybody who crossed his path. That's what made him so, so dangerous. And uh, yeah, I'm probably lucky to be here because if dad had run afoul of him as a youngster, things might be different now. So the people from the East Kilbride Police Museum have said that there are women who are now in their 60s and older that will come in to talk about Peter Manuel and they will vividly remember the fear they experienced during that time and that their fathers or elder brothers uh, would meet them getting off the buses or getting home from their lifts um, they'd meet everybody coming back from a night out and they would all sort of try to bound together for safety because this was the effect that this monster had on people people were frightened of Peter Manuel and um, yeah he was like the, the Lanarkshire boogeyman and he only had a two-year reign of terror in eastern Glasgow but it was a like two years of just absolute terror of this guy because, well, you're going to find out why as the case progresses. So let's just talk a little bit about Peter. So Peter was the second of three children and he was born to Samuel and Bridget Manuel. So Peter actually wasn't born in Glasgow or Scotland. Uh, he was actually born. Now, this gives me the chills where he was born. So he was born in the Misericordia Hospital in Manhattan, New York on the 15th of March, 1927. I wasn't born here in Grafton. I was born in Sydney and it was called the Marta Misericordia Hospital or Misericordia, however you want it. But that's nearly the same name of the hospital that I was born in. And he was active when my dad was a little kid in Scotland. So, yeah, it's, it's very spooky. There's a lot of spooky coincidences coming up around this. And just the fact that I could never get any off my mind. And it used to be funny, like, if I'd listen to Smooth Criminal by Michael Jackson and you get to the part where he's, Annie, are you okay? I always used to think about Annie Neelands every time I heard that song. So as we were just saying, he was born in New York on the 15th of March, 1927. His parents had emigrated to America to seek a better life during the depression of the 1920s. So they tried to settle in Detroit, Michigan, and his father Samuel was working at a car factory and Bridget working as a domestic servant. But Samuel eventually became ill and poverty drove them back to Scotland in 1932. They were unsettled on their return and moved from a town called Motherwell to Coventry in 1937. And by this time, Peter was around 10 years of age and he had an American accent. And Peter did not settle in very well to Scottish or English school life. And it has been said in some of the documentaries that I watched that Peter was horribly bullied at school. Um, he was made fun of by the other kids and he didn't seem to have a lot of friends. And you find that with a lot of these serial killers are either very popular and charismatic or they were the complete pole opposite that were being teased and, and, and beaten up. And kids are, you know, kids are just cruel at that age, but they don't realise what it is that actually sets some of these people off. And it was also said that like many serial killers, Peter Manuel would start with animals. And as I'm watching the, the documentary, I was expecting him to say that he was going around the neighbourhood, maybe killing birds or neighbourhood pets. Oh, no, no. He had his sights on bigger game than that. He would go around killing people's herd animals at their farms. We're talking big animals like sheep or cattle. He would kill them with a knife. Now, I myself am scared witless of cows. I mean, don't laugh. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, when we moved to our little farm place here, 
uh, when I was first going out with my husband before we got married, my father-in-law had cattle outside here. Now, we had three really nice cows, and then we had one that was called Blue Cow the Moo Cow. I was scared absolutely witless of this thing. She would chase you. She would buck. She would put her head down and try and charge you. She used to get into the yard all the time, but I have to ring my, my father-in-law to come and get her out. I couldn't do anything with her. I once got stuck in the house and couldn't go to work because she was between me and my car. So, you know, cows are a big, heavy, scary animal. And this was what Peter Manuel began his career with, were big farm animals like that. So that'll tell you the mentality of this guy way back from when he was a kid. So his first brush with the law happened in around 1938. And he had no scruples at all. He broke into a chapel and he stole the offertory box. Peter was never out of trouble and over the next few years, he was a regular inmate of the Borstalls and approved schools. Now we get into his teenage years. Like he was in and out of trouble the whole time that he was growing up. He wasn't getting along with other children. He was getting into fights. He was going around attacking animals. So he's around 15 when he commits his first act of real violence against a person. And he attacked a sleeping woman with a hammer because he used to like going around also breaking into people's homes. And he would break into their homes, he would eat their food, he would make them so, himself comfortable in there. And this particular time he attacked a woman with a hammer. And as I watched uh, the documentary about him it is thought that he may have tried to essay the lady as well but was unable to perform so he contented himself with just assaulting her and then leaving the premises so for this peter went to leeds prison and about this time was when his parents moved back to lanarkshire after they lost their home to the bombing of coventry and Peter followed after he was released from the Borstal. Leading on to the 16th of February, 1946, Peter then broke into a bungalow in the Sandy Hills area of Lanarkshire. Detective Constable William Munsey, later in Strathclyde, in Strathclyde Police, and a local sergeant searched the house and found a bedroom in the loft. Having satisfied themselves it was empty, they gathered the productions together and took them away for fingerprint examination. So what they mean by the productions, they have to remember this is all worded um, in 1940s Scottish lingo as well, um, the article that I read for this. And I just kind of liked the way that they put that, so I kept it in. So what they mean by the productions is what he had left behind. It just means the evidence that was produced. So I'm finding that really interesting. So Peter later that day realises he's forgotten a cup in the kitchen of a house that appeared to have a fingerprint on it. DC Muncie returned to the house and he's just in time to see Peter emerge from the garden. And he's caught him and established that Peter Manuel had been living in the house secretly behind all this wooden panelling in the loft when he searched the house. So the owners of the house are just living their day-to-day -day lives. They don't know that Peter Manuel is in fact living upstairs in their loft quite comfortably. And that's creepy. That's one of the creepiest things when we explore these cases. And there's been a few, and a lot of them do sort of happen in the UK, of people living inside other people's homes. Like with some of the homeless people or people seeking asylum from domestic violence, you can kind of understand that they're just there because they've got nowhere else to go. They're just living in peace. They're quietly going about their lives until their situation gets better. But not all of them were like that. And this was true for Peter Manuel. So how creepy would it have been for these people? Oh, you know what? This guy's living up in your loft. And then you find out some years later that he's actually a serial killer. That's a really frightening thought. 
but being arrested for this did not slow him down. While he was on bail for that particular offence, he then goes on to commit three assaults on wo on women, and this would include a, this time, successful essay of an expectant mother. So when I was watching the documentary, I think this lady was actually around eight months pregnant when he assaulted her. And again, that's just absolutely terrifying because you'd be wondering what's he going to do next? Is he going to try and unalive me and my baby? What's going to happen here? So he was just a, an absolute horror, this guy. So the public get a, a little a little bit of a break from Peter Manuel as he gets eight years in prison in Peterhead Prison for this offence. But he also won the praise of the judge for the skill of which he conducted his own defence. He was released in the summer of 1953, aged 26. So he's gotten out of prison. He is not a reformed character. If anything, he gets worse from there. So now we are leading up to the story that led me to this case here today, the discovery of Annie Nealands. So it was an afternoon, Wednesday, January 4, 1956, and it was the day that marked the beginning of one of the largest police investigations that Scotland had ever seen to that date and it would last for exactly two years. On a cold, dry afternoon, a gentleman named George Gribbon was taking a walk on the golf course in East Kilbride when he found the body of a young woman in a wooded area known as Capel Rig Copes. So frightened and sickened by the sight of the poor girl's body, Mr. Gribbon then ran towards the road and saw some gas board engineers that were working in the area. He ran over to them and he told them what was going on. They thought he was joking at first. So then he ran off towards a farm just up the road called Calder Glen. And that was where he would call the police. This gets graphic, so be warned. If you want to skip this part, um, go forward about five minutes. But this is a graphic a retelling of unfortunately what happened to our girl, Annie. And yeah, I'm getting a little emotional because she's been in my head my entire life because I always wondered who she was. So the first responders at the scene found that her head had been smashed in. They also saw marks of running feet in the mud, which had indicated that this lady had run for her life, like running for her absolute life. And that had been for over 400 yards. So there were marks from her panicked flight away from whoever had done this to her. So she had run for her life over 400 yards. And they also found that she had been indecently assaulted or essayed. And yes, the woman was identified as our Anne Nealands, a 17 year old who had lived with her parents on the Calderwood estate. So Annie had gone dancing as a lot of young people did back then. And this was during, as I said before, the Hogmanay holiday on the 2nd of January, but she did not return home as expected. So if you guys don't know what Hogmanay is, it's usually, well, it's been described to me by my dad and uh, other Scottish people that I know as just like this wild night of house parties, drinking, music, and, and it's a lot of fun. And it's the equivalent of our new year but it's, it's a Hogmanay. So you can imagine it's quite Celtic as well. And um, I'm really hoping that one day I do actually get to go to Scotland. I do still have uncles and cousins over in Scotland and I would love to go over there for Hogmanay, but I will stay at a relative's house. I won't go walking through any estates after the 
parties because we all see how that turns out for poor Annie. So she'd gone dancing with friends for the Hogmanay holiday, but she did not return home as expected. At first, her parents were thinking, well, maybe Annie, as she did often, had stayed at a friend's home, maybe it had gotten late, and she didn't want to walk home that late, or she couldn't get a lift, whatever. So they weren't too worried at first, but as the time went by and she wasn't home for dinner, you know, she wasn't home when they actually expected her, uh, they finally report her missing around the 4th of January. So there's been a couple of days go by and she wasn't reported missing straight away, but judging by the description of what happened to her, I don't think reporting her missing any sooner would have helped her, unfortunately. So this was a very large investigation, as I mentioned before, it was the biggest that Scotland had ever seen. And the investigation team was led by a man called Detective Chief Superintendent James Hendry of the Lanarkshire CID. And from its early stages, Peter's name was mentioned frequently. So one incidence of peace, people, you know, supposing it could have been Peter, was when a constable named James, James Marr, on speaking to the foreman of the gas board gang who had been working near the body, remarked that one of his workers, Peter Manuel, had been to prison for indecent assault and had scratches on his face that were not there before the 2nd of January when Anne went missing. He was interviewed then by Detective Chief Superintendent Hendry. But now this is really insidious and I reckon his dad knew exactly what he'd done because he'd been to prison previously. And I guess he just didn't want shame befalling the family again and having him sent back to prison or be looked at as a suspect in this case. His father provides an alibi for him. And any further attempts to find more evidence of who may have done this to Annie or whether it was Peter proved negative. So he wasn't, you know, arrested or charged with this crime straight away because his father provided him an alibi. And also when I was watching the documentaries, his brothers had also been in jail a few times and his father was also known as a very bad alcoholic. So he didn't come from the best of families. And I imagine he probably caught hell from his father just for being under suspicion for this crime. But did that stop Peter? No. Later that year on the 15th of September, police were called to a break-in at a home in Bothwell, which bore all of Peter Manuel's MO or modus operandi. What he used to like to do, now this is a very strange thing, like a lot of serial killers have these kind of oh, rituals or, you know, their modus operandi, as I just said. But what he liked to do, his little hallmark was throwing tins of food onto the carpet and walking mud all over the house. And then he would go into the bedrooms and he would jump all over people's beds and with, the, with his muddy feet and put mud marks all over the bedding as well it was kind of and that's really weird because that's like giving the police here have some forensics because how many times have people been you know put at the scene of a crime by the way their shoes look or the you know the patterns on the bottoms of their shoes so this guy was just an absolute lunatic he didn't even care if he was going to be caught i don't think because why leave so much evidence of yourself at a, at a house that you've broken into? So he's left tins of food thrown under the carpet. He's left his muddy boot marks everywhere. The police have been in. They've looked. They're thinking, yep, this could be him. Did he stop? No, he didn't. He was out the very next evening. And there was a similar break-in at another house at 18 Fens Bank Avenue, Burnside. This time, a quantity of cash and jewellery was taken. And again, Peter empties food tins onto the carpet and footprints were left all over the carpet as well and the bedding 
just like the night before. So he's just out doing his thing. He just seems to not care whether he is caught or not for what he's doing. So that brings us to the next morning on the 17th of September. The police are then called to 5 Fensbank Avenue to the house of the Watt family. And this is very graphic and horrible as well, as Peter Manuel killed an entire family. And it was actually the father and husband of the people who were killed that was initially blamed for this crime. So William Watt, who was the father and husband of the victims, went on a fishing holiday to Argyle. And he did this a lot. This wasn't like the first time he'd ever done it. He, he used to go to, to Argyle and other places fishing a lot. So he's left at home his wife Marion and his daughter Vivian, who was age 16, and his wife's sister, Margaret Brown. So he goes on his fishing trip, and it is not until the next day when the housekeeper arrived, a lady named Helen Collinson, she arrived at the house to find the curtains pulled and a glass panel on the front door broken. She called the police and what they found when they entered the house, they found Mary and Watt, Margaret Brown and Vivian were all shot to death in their beds. It was later established that a Webley service revolver had been the murder weapon. So it looks like a service revolver had come into the possession of the killer. So that's interesting because when we're talking service revolvers, we are usually talking a police issued weapon. So the police investigation again includes Peter Manuel. He keeps coming up a lot because he was breaking into a lot of homes back then. So because they, he's raised their interest, they this time obtain a search warrant for his parents' house at 32 Fourth Street in Uddingston, but to no avail. They couldn't find anything to link Peter to the crime. Peter also refused to speak to the police and his father would then complain that the family were being victimised by the police. Mm -hmm. He didn't even question whether his son had committed these crimes, you know, whether there was any validity, because it seems to me, from what I saw in the documentaries as well, that this man had kind of a bad attitude towards the police as well. So he would not have provided them with any information regarding the activities of his son. So the police also suspected William Watt, the, the, the father and husband of the deceased people um, and brother-in-law. So the reason they suspected William was that he was actually a former war reserve policeman. And they thought at first that he may have been involved in the deaths because he would have access to such a weapon. Extensive tests were carried out to verify if what had driven back to Glasgow overnight, murdered his family, and then returned to Loch Gilfed to complete his alibi where he was fishing. Whilst the results of most of the tests did prove to be inconclusive, a ferry master and another motorist did identify Watt as having made the journey and both identified him in an identification parade at the police station. From there, William Watt was arrested and charged with the three murders and held in Barlini prison. So, so we have Peter Manuel running around Glasgow, having the time of his life, breaking into houses. He is indecently assaulting women. He is killing people. And now he's got somebody else taking the fall for three murders that he committed of a family. But there's another twist to this story. Whilst William Watt was actually in Barlini prison, guess who else was there? Manuel was also held there. And this is the insidious nature of this man. Now, I'm not sure why Manuel was actually in Barlini prison 
at the same time as this man whose family that he'd murdered, he would actually go and seek out this poor man and tell him he knew who the real killer was. This guy, my God, he's an absolute monster. So a man named Lawrence Dowdle, who was Watt's solicitor, would also interview Manuel, and he would also become convinced that Manuel was the real killer. Manuel was then also interviewed by detectives, but he refused to speak to them. After 67 days in custody, the case against William Watt had collapsed and he was released, thankfully. So in the meantime, Manuel is also released from prison. And on Sunday, the 29th of December, 1957, a man named William Cook of Mount Vernon, Lanarkshire, reported his 17-year-old daughter, Isabel, as missing to the police. As with what had happened to our poor Annie, she had gone to a dance the night before and had also not returned. And this started a frantic and panicked search by members of her family. So as part of this investigation, the police searched the river Calder and found one of Isabel's shoes and her handbag, as well as other personal effects. Detective Inspector John Ray and Chief Inspector Muncy were among the senior investigators investigating the girl's disappearance. Detective Superintendent Hendry had retired on the very day that Isabel Cook was reported missing. On Monday the 6th of January 1958, while Chief Inspector Muncy was leading a search of the area around the colliery air shaft, he looked up to see Chief Constable John Wilson of the Lanarkshire Police standing beside him. To his horror, Mr. Wilson then told him that three people had been found shot dead in a bungalow in Uddington. In Uddington. At this point, the Chief Constable of the Lanarkshire Police requested the assistance of two senior detectives from the City of Glasgow, Police and Detective Superintendent Alex Brown and Detective Inspector Tom Goodall were brought on as <coughs> were seconded to the inquiry. So the house where the bodies were found was at 38 Sheepburn Road, Uddingston, and it belonged to the Smart family. Peter Smart, 45, his wife Doris, and their 11-year-old son Michael lived in the house, and their bodies were found after Mr Smart had failed to turn up to his job on Monday morning, and his boss and co-workers became concerned. And as what had happened in the previous case with Mr. Watts' family, all three had been shot through the head with a Beretta pistol at point blank range while they were asleep. <clears throat> Inquiries with friends and neighbours and unopened mail indicated they had been dead for several days before they had been found. There was also evidence from neighbours that during that time the curtains had been opened and closed and lights switched on and off. And this would indicate that the killer had remained in the house with the bodies and returned several times without being seen. And this was also um, touched upon in greater scrutiny with the documentaries that I watched. What he would do now, what Manuel would do is he would go into this particular house and he may have even done it with Mr. Watts's family too, because this is his MO. I remember how he used to break into homes and he'd empty all the, the, the canned goods onto the, like open the cans and empty them onto the carpet and then walk through their house with his muddy feet and walk all over their beds. He would stay at a family's home that he had just killed. He'd make himself comfortable, he'd lay around on their couch, he'd eat their food. And I'm trying to remember what family it was I think it may have been this one he actually fed their cat because he was like oh well you know what I've killed this family I'm gonna open this really nice tin of salmon I'm gonna feed the cat with it because the cat's hungry he'd go on to tell the police yeah I fed the cat 
because there was nobody alive to eat the salmon. My God in heaven, this, this guy, honestly. And it's just no wonder that East Kilbride was in a grip of fear of this guy because he just thought he was above the law. He thought he could go anywhere and do anything that he wanted to do. And the weird part was, like, like we explored before, earlier in the case when he was a kid, he would kill the livestock of neighbouring farms. His dad got him a German Shepherd dog when he was growing up. And Peter was, to all accounts, wonderful with this dog. He loved this dog. He'd walk him, he'd feed him. He took such good care of his dog. And then, you know, he's, he's out killing people. He's killing livestock. But it's weird that he differentiates with family type pets like a cat or a dog. Now that would be the first animals you would think somebody like him would start with or you know he's killed their family what's going to stop him from killing these animals he doesn't he feeds the cat he makes sure it's got milk he makes sure it's got salmon to eat because oh well you know the, the family's dead so i thought the cat might like the salmon this, this guy is an absolute nutter and it's just no wonder that people were so frightened of him he's just an absolute lunatic So the Chief Inspector Muncy, who was investigating the case, was extremely intrigued by these circumstances. And he remembered his arrest earlier in the piece of Manuel in 1946, when he had actually slept in the loft of the house, remember that? After breaking into it. And he stayed there for a few days, with nobody knowing he was there. So the evidence was accumulating against Manuel but the final piece of the puzzle was the banknotes from the Smart household. And they were found to have been spent by Manuel in local public houses. And that just means he spent them at the pub. So finally, on the 14th of January, 1958, the nightmare for Glasgow ends when Peter Manuel is arrested and charged with the murder of the Smart family. And this would lead police to finding the murder weapons the Beretta and Webley pistols, and they were recovered from the River Clyde. So the police would then conduct a search of Manuel's parents' home, and they would produce a lot of stolen items from the house break-ins from Mount Vernon. And there had been several items in Samuel Manuel's room, his father, and he was arrested for being in possession of the items. So Peter would then hear of his father's arrest, and he would then decide that he would talk to the police. So he then asks for a meeting with the inspector, Robert McNeil of the inquiry team. So inspector McNeil at 3 p.m. on the 15th of January, 1958, and his colleague, Detective Inspector, Detective inspector Tom Goodall would enter Peter Manuel's cell and he offered the officers a deal. He told them if they would release his father, he would come clean about the crimes and take the officers to where the body of Isabel Cook was buried and the place where he threw the guns in the Clyde River. This would begin a long series of confessions by Peter Manuel to the murder of Annie Nealans, the Watt and Smart families and Isabel Cook. Eight murders, which would make him Scotland's most prolific mass murderer to that date. He was also the prime suspect in the murder of a Newcastle cab driver, Sidney Dunn, who was murdered on the 8th of December 1957 while in town for a job interview. So this would lead finally to the trial of Peter Manuel. So it would open in Glasgow in the High Court on Monday the 12th of May 1958 and this was to last a total of 14 days and is one of the most documented trials in Scottish history. So not only was the trial surprisingly short by modern standards but it took the jury only 2 hours and 21 minutes of deliberations to convict Peter Manuel. He was sentenced to death at 4.45pm on the 26th of May 1958, which after, a fail, which after a failed appeal was carried out at 8am on the 11th 
of July 1958. Finally, Glasgow's nightmare had come to an end. From here, there would be few members of the public who mourned the death of Peter Manuel. After this, many families slept easier in their beds and the young people relaxed and could finally enjoy an evening out without feeling fear of being attacked or killed, particularly in the Lanarkshire area, after Manuel was arrested. Anyway, that is it for this week's story. I hope you guys found this interesting. And if you would like, I will um, also include the link to the other documentary about Peter Manuel that I watched in the description box below. There's a lot of them on here if you want to find out more about him. They're probably all pretty much the same, but if you want to look further into it um, and just like hear some of the, 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 um, the testimonies and stuff from people who were actually there or, or you know, historians that were involved, um, it is it is an interesting watch, and they've actually like got footage of Scotland and stuff in that documentary. It's very interesting. So stay safe, everybody. Uh, I might be a little bit slow with videos next week. Um, we do have a brush grove night this this Thursday night for the open mic night at Brush Grove. That I have the pleasure, the very great pleasure, of going to film. For the original sound lounge every second thursday so i'll be filming that and then the next morning we are off on our road trip so there's going to be a lot of editing that needs to be done for the original sound lounge when i get back from my trip and there will be all the footage from the amazing trip that i'm going on this weekend to an amazing town uh it's very historic very beautiful and i think you guys are going to love it so that'll be up for the next for the for the new channel so please bear with me and then there'll be more um true crime and stuff on this channel following my trip so stay safe everybody i want to see you all back here when i get back and uh just have a beautiful week and for goodness sake go watch something funny after this because this this was another horrible case anyway i love you all so so much thank you all for joining me once again and i'll see you all again very soon bye